The new Ryzen 3 CPUs are here, which means it's time for another budget build guide. I'm going to show you how to assemble a $650 gaming PC build, including all the little fiddly wires and screws before booting it up to see how it looks and, crucially, how it performs. So without any further ado, let's get into it. As with all of my builds, we're going to kick things off with the CPU, motherboard, and the RAM. But first, if you aren't already following me on Instagram, please do it. I'll link it in the description below. Shameless promo aside though, the motherboard I've selected to use is MSI's B450M Pro VDH Max. To put it simply, this board is a superb budget option that supports our Ryzen 3 chip out of the box without any need for a BIOS update. Talking of our Ryzen 3 chip, this here is the brand new AMD Ryzen 3 3100. Find the golden triangle on your CPU and line this up with the triangle on your motherboard. It's then a case of dropping the CPU into place, give it a little bit of a wiggle and pop the arm down. It's super easy and you haven't got to force it. The next step is to install our CPU cooler. And for this, I've opted to stick with the free AMD stock cooler that comes included with your CPU. This will come with pre-applied thermal paste on the bottom, so no need to apply your own if this is brand new. Then line it up with the four holes on your motherboard before using a standard screwdriver to tighten it up corner by corner. It's a good idea to kind of alternate between which ones you tighten up as not to put pressure on any one bit of the CPU at once. And then to make sure our fan's got enough power to spin up, you need to take this cable and plug it into our CPU fan header at the top of the motherboard. The final component to go on our motherboard assembly, as we're going to call it, is our RAM, and this is the Team Group T-Force Delta RGB. To install this, we're going to spin the motherboard around slightly and pull back the clips on slots number two and slots number four. Find the notch on your RAM dim and line that up with the notch on your motherboard. It's then a case of slotting the RAM in and pushing it down from either side. Do the same for as many dims as you've got, in my case two, and just like that, it's in. With our motherboard assembly just placed to one side over there, we're now going to grab the case. This is the Cooler Master Q300L, and I've used it quite a lot recently, and that's because it's a superb budget option. The first thing to do with any case is to take off any of the side panels. I'm going to need a screwdriver for this one. Taking the side panels off any case makes it a lot, lot easier to work with. In your case, you're going to find a box or a bag like this, which contains all the screws we need to actually build the system. Before we can slide our motherboard into the case, there's a couple of things we need to do. First, take this metal I.O. shield from your motherboard box, and this clips into the rear of the case. It's pretty easy to clip in and just sort of clicks in corner by corner. Then we need to check that there are standoffs in the case that line up with the holes on our motherboard. So in this case, our motherboard has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight holes. And you can see here, the case actually contains standoffs. If you're missing a standoff, like I am, then extra ones, including a tool to install them, can be found included with that case accessory box. Then we're gonna simply slide our motherboard into place and screw it down with these included screws. With our motherboard installed, I'm actually going to plug in some of our cables and wires now, while it's a lot, lot easier to do so. The first is we're going to plug the rear fan in. We can simply take the fan cable and plug it into the system fan one header on our motherboard, just like so. I'm then going to do some of our front panel cables. The first is our USB 3, which I'm going to thread through this hole underneath our motherboard. Then line the notch up uh, with the slot on your motherboard and it clips into place just like so. It will only go one way around, so don't force it. It's a similar story for our HD audio cable, but I'm gonna run this one through here, underneath the bottom left of our motherboard. While it's a different design to USB 3, it's still keyed, which means it will only go in one way around. Finally, the last cables to install are actually these, our front panel cables. I'll pop a diagram on your screen now so you can follow along a little bit easier. 
Uh, but the summary is, if you pop these in the wrong pins, don't worry. Nothing's going to explode, your system won't catch fire, it just won't turn on and you'll have to go and change them about. We're then going to spin the case around and install our power supply before getting onto the graphics card, which I know a lot of you are going to be excited for. This is my exact choice of power supply unit. It's the Thermaltake Smart TRS 500 Watt. Is it a budget power supply? Yes. Is it a little bit messy with all these cables? Yes, but it's great value, it's got a good reputation, and it's 80 plus certified. You want to get a power supply from a reputable manufacturer. That's gonna save you a lot of headaches later on down the line. If we spin the case around, you'll see that we can't just slot the power supply straight in. We actually need to take this bracket out, mount the PSU to the bracket, and slot it back in. So let me show you how it's done. Remove these four screws at the back of your case first. And once we've done that, that's gonna free our bracket, which looks a little something like this. I'm next gonna thread all the power supply cables through the back of the case before using the same screws as before to secure it back in place. Then the final step is to plug up some of our PSU cables before we install our GPU. The first is our 20 plus 4 pin motherboard power connector. This is the biggest of the bunch and plugs into the side of our motherboard. Next up is our 4 plus 4 pin CPU power connector, which goes to the top left of our motherboard. And finally, we're going to slot through a GPU power connector, which has 6 plus 2 pins, uh, ready for when we install our graphics card. Talking of our graphics card, here it is. It's from MSI and it's the brand new Radeon 5500 XT. It's one of the best budget GPU options around and also makes this an all AMD build. If you want to see my 1660 super build, I'll leave that in the card section here as well. Look at that. That is like the perfect graphics card for this case. It's going to look so well proportioned. In order to install our graphics card, we need to take off uh, the two PCIe slot covers at the rear of the case. That can be done just like so with the same screws we used for our power supply and they fall off super duper easily. You then want to take the you then want to take, before I was rudely interrupted, uh, the clip at the back of your PCIe slot and push it down. Line the graphics card up and it will clip down super easily into place. We're going to use the same screws we removed a second ago to tighten our GPU nice and easily in place before pulling uh, the power cable we ran a moment ago and simply clicking it in to our graphics card. Now we're almost at the stage where we can boot this machine up and play some games on it. The final component we need to install though is our storage. This is from Kingston and it's their A400. It's a budget SSD that's gonna be a lot, lot quicker than any hard drive solution. Now what I'm about to say is gonna be a bit controversial, so brace yourself. Take the SATA cable included with your motherboard and plug it into one end of the drive and then take the other end and run this through, then take one of the SATA power cables. That looks a little something like this, and plug that in to your SSD. Then we can tidy the cables and simply slot our SSD into the back of the case. Oh my God, James, have you just done that? An SSD has got no moving parts, so you could even tape it or Velcro it if you want. You don't have to use the mount. And I've had SSDs like that for years with no problems whatsoever. So let's tidy these cables up, whack our side panels on, and boot the machine up to see how it looks, but more importantly, how it performs. Roll the montage. Now that we've seen just how good this system looks and how to put it together, let's dive in and see exactly how it performs. I've benchmarked a load of different titles including some of the latest releases as well as some older, more popular games to get a really even picture. I'm kicking things off with Overwatch, my favourite game at the minute. 1080p ultra settings, we're seeing here 130 plus frames per second and these are all at 1080p, medium to high settings with stuff like V-Sync turned off and anti-aliasing turned down to get the best possible frame rate. 
Graphically, Overwatch looks great, and at ultra settings, there's no complaints from me. Next up on the list is Warzone. Uh, Call of Duty's latest Battle Royale venture is the hardest game, I'd say, on the list uh, to run today, but here at medium settings, which it kind of auto-selected, we're seeing 100 plus frames per second, which is very, very impressive. You know, you want to stick consistently above 60 FPS where you can, so the fact Warzone can do that while looking pretty incredible is a great sign. The next game on my list is a racing title, Forza Horizon 4, uh, my favourite racing game to date. Here at Ultra Settings, that was once again determined by the game itself, we're looking at 85 to 95 FPS. And that's a pretty incredible number when you actually realise and think about uh, that games like Forza Horizon 4 run at 30 or 40 FPS uh, on the current generation Xbox One and Xbox One X Pro. Um, so from that perspective, no complaints at all. The next game is one of the most popular, maybe the most popular, GTA 5. Here at medium to high settings with some of our extended scaling distance bars uh, toned down to around about halfway and we're looking at 65 plus frames per second. You could definitely tune the settings down a little bit uh, to bump it above the 75, 80 FPS mark, but this was running really smoothly and graphically looked pretty fantastic in my opinion. Battlefield 5 is the next game on my list today, and whilst it's probably fallen off in popularity a little bit, it's still a really great game to kind of compare as a benchmark, not only between my other PCs, but those built by others as well. Battlefield 5 has a reputation for being really hard to run because it was the first game to support Nvidia's ray tracing. But of course with RTX disabled and not supported by this machine, we're seeing here at medium to high settings around 90 FPS, which means it's running really, really well. As I said, you want to sustain above 60 in first person shooters, and it does that without a struggle. At the next first person shooter on my list today, another battle royale game is of course Apex Legends. 1080p medium settings, we're looking around about 100 frames per second, which is bonkers. I find Apex Legends runs better than some other games and also indicates that Fortnite on this system would also perform really well at around medium settings, 100 FPS. The penultimate game on my list today before we jump into CSGO is Project Cars 2. High settings, 110 to 130 FPS. So any of you sim racers out there watching, this system has more than got you covered, even if Project Cars 2 is a slightly easier game to run. And as promised a moment ago, the final game on my list today is CSGO, Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Here at high settings, we're seeing a whopping 240 plus frames per second which is insane. CSGO is a really easy game to run, but those esports kind of frame rates mean you can play competitive kind of CSGO standards on this machine without being at any form of disadvantage. With that being said though, I think that just about wraps it up for today's GeekerWatt video. If you did enjoy it, make sure to give it a big old like rating and get subscribed. But as always, we'll see you in the next GeekerWatt video.